Chapter 14 The Peddler is Found It was a long time before Mary moved away from the stairs. Something of her own strength had gone, leaving her powerless like the figure on the floor. It was the silence that frightened her most. Now that the clock was no longer going, her ears missed the sound of it. Her light shone on the walls, but it did not reach to the top of the stairs, where the darkness waited for her. She knew that she could never climb those stairs again, nor walk along that upper passage. Whatever lay above her must stay there. She backed away down the hall along the passage, and when she came to the kitchen and saw the door still open, her self-control left her, and she ran blindly through the door to the cold air outside, where the familiar figure of Richards met her. He put out his hands to save her, and she seized him, feeling for comfort, cold now from the shock. He's dead, she said. He's dead there, on the floor. I saw him. And although she tried hard, she could not stop shaking. He led her to the side of the road, back to the carriage. Has your aunt gone? he whispered. Mary shook her head. I don't know. I didn't see. I had to come away. He saw by her face that her strength had gone. All right, then, he said. All right. Sit quiet, then. No one shall hurt you. There now. His rough voice helped her, and she sat close beside him. That was no sight for a girl to see. You should have let me go. I wish now you'd stayed back here in the carriage. That's terrible for you, to see him lying there, murdered. Talking helped her. The horse was still in the stable. I listened at the door and heard it moving about. They had never even finished their preparations for going. The kitchen door was not locked, and there were packages on the floor there, ready to load into the wagon. It must have happened several hours ago. I don't know what the magistrate is doing, said Richards. He should have been here before this. You should tell your story to him. There has been bad work here tonight. They fell silent, and both of them watched the road. Who could have killed the landlord? said Richards, confused. He can deal with most men, and should have been able to defend himself. There were plenty who might have done it, though. If ever a man was hated, he was. There was the peddler, said Mary slowly. I'd forgotten about him. It must have been him breaking out from the locked room. She seized on this idea to escape from another, and she retold the story, eagerly now, of how the peddler had come to the inn the night before. It seemed then that the crime was proved, and there could be no other explanation. He'll not run far before the magistrate catches him, said Richards. No one can hide on these moors, unless he's a local man, and I've never heard of Harry the Peddler before. But then, they came from every hole and corner in Cornwall, just Merlin's men. They were the lowest of the low from the whole area. He paused, and then, I'll go to the inn, if you would like me to, and see for myself whether he has left any tracks behind him. There might be something. Mary seized hold of his arm. I don't want to be alone again, she said quickly. Think me a fool if you will, but I couldn't bear it. If you had been inside Jamaica in tonight, you would understand. Something has happened to my aunt as well. I know that. I know she is dead. That's why I was afraid to go upstairs. She's lying there in the darkness, in the passage above. Whoever killed my uncle will have killed her too. 
the servant coughed. She may have run out onto the moor. She may have run for help along the road. No, whispered Mary. She would never have done that. She would be with him now, by his side. She's dead. I know she's dead. If I hadn't left her, this would never have happened. The man was silent. He could not help her. After all, she was a stranger to him, and what had happened was no concern of his. Mary held up a warning hand. Listen, she said. Can you hear something? They looked to the north. The distant sound of horses was unmistakable. It's them, said Richards excitedly. It's the magistrate. He's coming at last. They waited. The noise drew near, and Richards, in his relief, ran out onto the road to greet them, shouting and waving his arms. The leader pulled up his horse, calling out in surprise at the sight of him. What are you doing here? he shouted. It was Mr. Bassett himself. He held up his hand to warn his followers behind. The landlord is dead! Murdered! cried his servant. I have a young relative of his here with me in the carriage. It was Mrs. Bassett who sent me out here, sir. He held the horse for his master, answering as well as he could the rapid questions put to him. If the man has been murdered, he deserved it, but I'd still rather have put him in chains myself. You cannot punish a dead man. The magistrate, whose mind worked slowly, began to realise what Mary was doing in the carriage. He had thought at first that she was his servant's prisoner. This is too difficult for me to understand, he said. I believed you to be working with your uncle against the law. Why did you lie to me when I came earlier in the month? You told me you knew nothing. I lied because of my aunt, said Mary. Whatever I said to you then was only for her, nor did I know as much then as I do now. You did a brave thing in walking all that way to alter none to warn me, but all this trouble could have been avoided, and the terrible crime of that night could have been prevented if you had been open with me before. But we can talk about that later. I must ask you to wait in the yard. He led his men round the back, and before long the dark and silent house seemed to come to life. The windows were thrown open, and some of the men went upstairs and explored the rooms above. Someone called sharply from the house. After a time, the magistrate himself came out into the yard and walked over to the carriage. I'm sorry, he said. I have bad news for you. Perhaps you expected it. Yes, said Mary. I don't think she suffered at all. She was lying just inside the bedroom at the end of the passage, killed with a knife, like your uncle. She could have known nothing. Believe me, I'm very sorry. I wish I could have kept this from you. He stood by her awkwardly, and then, seeing that Mary was better left alone, he walked back across the yard to the inn. Mary sat without moving, and prayed in her own way that Aunt Patience would understand what she had tried to do, and would forgive her and find peace now, wherever she might be. Once again, there was excitement in the house, shouting and the sound of running feet. There was a crash of splitting wood, and the shutters were torn away from the windows of the locked room, which no one, it seemed, had entered until now. Then, round the corner of the yard, they came, six or seven of them, led by the magistrate, holding among them something that fought to escape. They've got him! It's the murderer! 
shouted Richards. The prisoner looked up at her, his face and clothes dirty. It was Harry the peddler. What do you know of this man? The magistrate said to Mary. We found him in the locked room there, lying on the floor. He says he knows nothing of the crime. He was one of the company, said Mary slowly, and he came to the inn last night and quarrelled with my uncle. My uncle aimed a gun at him and locked him up in the locked room, threatening him with death. He had every reason to kill my uncle, and no one could have done it except him. He is lying to you. But the door was locked. It took three of us to break it down from the outside. This man had never been out of the room at all. Look at his clothes. Look at his eyes, blinded still by our light. He's not your murderer. Mary knew then that what Mr. Bassett had said was the truth. Harry the peddler could not have done the murders. We'll have him in prison, in spite of that, and hang him too, if he deserves it, which I'll swear he does. But first, he shall give us the names of his companions. One of them has killed the landlord, you may be sure of that, and we'll track him down if we have to set every dog in Cornwall on his heels. They dragged the peddler away, swearing and begging them to let him go turning his rat's eyes now and again on Mary, who sat above him in the carriage a few yards away. She neither heard his curses nor saw his ugly, narrow eyes. She remembered other eyes that had looked at her that morning and another voice that had spoken calmly and coldly, saying of his brother, He shall die for this. There was the sentence thrown out carelessly on the way to Lanson Fair. I have never killed a man, yet. And there was the old woman in the market square. There's blood on your hands. You'll kill a man one day. All the little things she wanted to forget rose up and shouted against Jem. His hatred of his brother. His cruelty his bad Merlin blood. He had gone to Jamaica Inn as he had promised, and his brother had died as he had sworn. The whole truth was there in front of her in its ugliness. He was a thief, and like a thief in the night, he had come and gone again. When morning came, he would jump on a horse and ride away out of Cornwall forever. A murderer like his father before him. In her imagination, she heard the sound of his horse on the road, far away in the quiet night. But the sound she heard was not the dream thing of her imagination, but the real sound of a horse coming towards her. She turned her head and listened. The sound of a horse drew nearer still. She was not alone now as she listened. The men looked towards the road, and Richards went quickly to the inn to call the magistrate. The sound of the horseman was loud now as he came over the top of the hill, and when he came into view, Mr. Bassett came out of the inn. Stop! he called. In the name of the king, I must ask your business on the road tonight. The horseman turned into the yard. When he took off his hat, his thick hair shone white under the moon, and the voice that spoke in answer was gentle and sweet. Mr. Bassett of North Hill, I believe, he said, and he leant forward with a note in his hand. I have a message here from Mary Yellen of Jamaica Inn, who asks for my help in trouble. But I see by the company here that I came too late. You remember me, of course. We have met before. I am the vicar of Alternun. <laughs>